see your faces, but especially after being gone, what seems like a very long time, it's good to see you all. Let's begin by turning to number 296. <clears throat> Number 296. We have come into his house and gathered in his name to worship him. We have come into his house and gathered in his name to worship him. We have come into his house and gathered in his name to worship Christ the Lord. Worship him, Christ the Lord. Let's forget about ourselves and magnify his name and worship him. Let's forget about ourselves and his name and worship him. Let's forget about ourselves and magnify his name and worship Christ the Lord. Worship him, Christ the Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do want to worship you this morning. Thank you for the privilege of gathering like this. Thank you for your son, Jesus, who is the light of the world, who is that perfect lamb that was sacrificed on our behalf. Thank you for the church. Pray for your church as we are gathered here this morning, but your church the world over. Help us to worship and adore you today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm going to do something a little different this morning. I'm not quite sure how it's going to come out. I'm a little nervous. I'm going to be talk doing more talking than usual, so that makes me nervous. But uh, I'd like to share three scenes from my recent trip to Germany and Romania. So bear with me. Uh, hopefully it can be a blessing. <laughs> Starting out, the first scene is in uh, Germany. Uh, we went to an Easter vigil, like they say, Easter night vigil. And it's interesting, as soon as the service started, it was in the evening, as soon as the service started, all the lights went off, and there were a number of scripture readings and, uh, and some special singing uh, where it was almost completely dark. We had lots of long pauses in between for meditation, and uh, when I felt like I was disappointed, I couldn't understand more of the German scriptures than I did. But uh, but there was lots of time for reflecting in between. The focus was on Jesus, the light of the world, which I could I could gather that much pretty easily. But eventually, as the service went on one candle appeared and then gradually the singers uh, took their candles and lit their candles from that one candle and then spread it throughout the congregation and everybody passed it down the light until everybody had their own candle burning. Uh, I thought it was kind of a neat illustration of the light coming into the world as Christ was resurrected on Easter morning. The last song, after the, light, the lights came on then eventually, and we sang a number of congregational songs, and uh, that I could at least uh, do a little better with. The last song we sang had two lines at the end, 
and that I could pretty much understand. And those of you that are better at German, forgive me. Sund ist vergeben, hallelujah. Jesus bringt Leben, hallelujah. Sin is forgiven, hallelujah. Jesus brings life, hallelujah. John 14, 19, Jesus said, because I live, you will also live. So as we follow the light of Jesus, then he also gives us life. After this service was over, we carried our candles home and maybe a little application if it's not stretching too far. Well, okay, the first one, I really like the idea of the candle lighting our way, Jesus lighting our way. Uh, we may not see very far ahead sometimes, but he will give us the light that we need as we look to him. I didn't realize till I got home that I had wax dripping on my jeans and my shoes. Uh, maybe a little bit of an application. Sometimes life gets messy, uh, but as we follow the light, we will make it safely home. Let's sing, the whole world was lost in the darkness of sin.
number 389. 389. <clears throat> and I almost miss noticing that this is a different tune than we usually sing, so let's just sing the usual tune that we know instead of what's written. Third verse, he says, I am this dark world's light. Look unto me, thy morn shall rise. I heard the voice of Jesus say, Come unto me and rest. Lay down the weary one, lay down thy head upon my breast. I came to Jesus as I was, weary and worn and sad. I found in him a resting place, and he has made me glad. I heard the voice of Jesus say, Behold, I freely give the living water, thirsty one, stoop down and drink and live. I came to Jesus and I drank all that life-giving stream. My thirst was quenched, my soul revived, and now I live in Him. I heard the voice of Jesus say, I am this dark world's light. Look unto me, thy morn shall rise, and all thy day be bright. I looked to Jesus, and I found in him my star, my son. And in that light of life I'll walk till all my journey. second scene, we moved to Romania, <clears throat> and to my surprise, I realized we're celebrating Easter all over again. They follow the Orthodox calendar and celebrate Easter a week later than we do here. Had a very unusual Good Friday service. Some of you may have seen my post on Facebook. Uh, first of all, there was a lot of scripture, uh, all read in three different languages. And the account, it was the account of the children of Israel and the first Passover. And then we actually sacrificed a lamb right there in front of us. <laughs> uh, it was rather interesting. It was not as gory as I thought it might be, but, uh, but yeah, the sacrificed lamb drained the blood. We had some doorposts there to spread the blood over the doorposts. And, uh, and then we ate the Passover meal with, uh, they had roasted some lamb ahead of time so that we had some ready to eat with herbs and unleavened bread. I must say it wasn't my favorite meal, but I liked the symbolism. It was a very meaningful illustration of how an innocent lamb was slain on our behalf. Turn to number 176. <clears throat> Number 176. Your only son, no sin to hide, but you have sent him from your side to walk upon this guilty side. 
and to become the Lamb of God. Your gift of love they crucified. They laughed and scorned him as he died. The humble king they named a fraud and sacrificed the Lamb of God. O Lamb of God, sweet Lamb of God, I love the Holy Lamb of God. O wash me precious blood, my Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. I was so lost, I should have died, but you have brought me to your side, to be led by your staff and to be called a Lamb of God. O Lamb of God, sweet Lamb of God, I love the Holy Lamb of God. O wash me in His precious blood, Thy Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. Now we move to scene three, Easter communion service at the church there in Suchava, Romania. It was I don't know what the right word is, fascinating. I guess it's one, but to me, it was hard to tell who was locals and who was refugees from Ukraine. Uh, eventually, I learned some of that, but uh, there, were, there were quite a good number of refugees there, uh, both some that were missionaries, but others that were uh, born Ukrainians. The singing. They indulged me by putting the English words up on the uh, wall, but everybody sang in whatever language they preferred, and I was one of very few singing English, I think. But uh, had prayers in three different languages, uh, and I never did quite clarify for sure, was it Ukrainian or Russian was the third one, but it was English and Romanian, and, and I feel kind of bad. I don't know for sure if it was in Russian or in Ukrainian. Uh, but it was just, it was really, just a really neat thing how these people all came together as one here through some of them through really hard times. And the, the sermon was in English, interpreted into Romanian, and the Ukrainians had earphones on to hear it in their own language. Craig Beachy, who some of you would remember, had the sermon about how suffering advances the church Kind of an interesting thought. There were many spontaneous prayers and hearty amens after everyone. Lots of testimonies even after 12 o'clock that rolled past. And uh, for me, maybe the most poignant moment was I had this gentleman come up the aisle. I was sitting next to the aisle and, and motioned that he wanted to wash feet with me. And of course, I didn't know him at all. Um, but afterwards, somebody told me who the man was, and he was a native Ukrainian who had laid across the border. His oldest son hid under the van seat, so because they were afraid, they would uh, keep him there and make him fight. And then on top of that, they, their 15-year-old son had a bicycle accident and, and killed him as, after they were in Romania. So that was after I realized who the man was. It was quite moving for me. There was lots of singing, 
big hugs from men you did, had no idea who they were, but uh, just very, very outgoing. And so yeah, it was really a neat experience. Let's turn to number 715. Notice verse 2, elect from every nation, and verse 3, mid toil and tribulation and tumult of the war, fitting words for this day. The church is one foundation, with Jesus Christ, our Lord. She is his new creation by water and the word. From heaven he came and sought to, to be his holy bride. With his own blood he bought her and for her life. from every nation yet one for all the earth her charter of salvation one lord one faith one birth one holy name she blessed partakes one holy to one hope she presses with every grace and blue. Mid toil and tribulation and to more of her war, she waits a consummation of Peace forevermore, till with a vision glorious, her longing eyes are blessed, and the great church victorious shall be the church at rest. Number 104. <clears throat> you know, we all have stormy winds that come into our lives, but obviously we haven't experienced some of the stormy winds that some people have. But regardless of how far sundered we are, we can all meet together around one common mercy seat. 104. From every stormy wind that blows, from every swelling tide, found beneath a mercy sea. There is a place where Jesus says, the all of gladness on our heads, a place and all beside. 
tears of blood for mercy. There is a scene where spirit plan when her friend holds fellowship with friend, no sun and far by day they meet around one common mercy. Sin and sense no less, no more, and hell comes down our souls to greet while glory crowns a mercy. I've never seen a plain church before where they have a choir that sings every Sunday, but that was the case in Sochava. And they allowed me to help with that, which was enjoyable, at least until they sang Romanian songs. But the, uh, so I'd like to close with a clip of the one song we sang that Sunday morning and just a little bit of comment on the singers in this choir. There's four of them in the choir are from a family where the father you could only say he was a hardened criminal uh, he told Marvin at one time that he's never done anything good in his life and uh, I think he still has some struggles but has come an amazingly long way and has a beautiful family uh, his wife came from the gypsies but uh, yeah they're just a really unique family and there, I know at least two of the uh, young ones with red hair are Ukra Ukrainian, mis uh, they're Ukrainian missionaries, but now are Ukrainian refugees. So just a little explanation on some of the singers in the choir and just an illustration of how from hard times, from different backgrounds, uh, we can come together in harmony.
Who want to say good morning? And it's good to be here. Uh, thank you, Cliff, for sharing all that, a real life experience. And I really enjoy venturing out like that, so that was exciting. Thank you for sharing that. Um, Ukrainians always is close to my heart. My great grandparents were Ukrainians, and so were Susie's great grandparents. So they're the ones that moved us out of Ukraine and into Canada. And it was my great grandparents that one of the first houses that was built is, a, is in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. I went through that town one time and I told my dad about it. And dad said, Oh, he said, uh, My grandparents built a house there and it's still there. You should have stopped by and looked at it. And I said, Dad, now you tell me. <laughs> yeah, the cranium really is, is close to my heart. I'm reading, going through a book right now by Applebaum. And she made a documentary in 2017 called The Red Famine. And um, there's a lot of our Mennonite names in that book. And when I see the pictures of the mass graves over there, I just sit there and I stare at them. And here we are less than 100 years later, and mass graves are happening again in this place. And, uh, and so, yeah, that kind of, kind of hits home when the word Ukrainian comes in. So thank you for sharing that. Yeah, well, um, I, I think it's when I think of experiences like that, I'm, I'm getting really excited about coming to the end of Revelation. It, it really, the book of Revelation ends, uh, it, it begins so good. Jesus introduces himself. The first verse says it is, the, it is the revelation of Jesus Christ. So Revelation isn't necessarily about me. It's not about the beast. It's not about the mark. It's about Jesus. And that's something as we end up, uh, as, as we go down now to this plane, um, we're, I want to really, really bring that out more and more. And so uh, we saw in how in um, the chapter 12 where, the, uh, where Satan's kingdom is, is uh, Michael's angels come and they bring it down and, and, and Satan and his army come down and land on the earth and it says, woe to the earth for he now dwells among you. And so when that happens is that uh, when he comes down to earth is that he sets up an, uh, another, um, 
headquarters. And that's something we're going to look at today. And so basically I've titled this message, Cleaning Up the Mess. And so I'm excited about that. We're, we finally get to clean up the mess. We've seen a lot of bad things happening. The Old Testament always calls revelations the great day of the Lord. God has never looked forward to this day, and he still doesn't. Peter tells us why it hasn't happened yet. He says scoffers will come in the last days, and they will say, oh, where's the day? You've been t talking about this for centuries. Nothing changes. And Peter says, oh, they've forgotten. Things do change. There was a time when he did uh, clean up the whole mess and created a, uh, a flood. And he cleaned up the mess then, and he started over. And so Revelations is another story like that. God's going to come, clean up the mess, and we're going to have a great restart. And it's going to be a time of restoration. It's going to be a time of no more messes. And I am looking so forward to that. When I think about all the messes Satan has created in my life, he still hinders me every day from wanting to be the Christian that I, I wish more that I was. And finally, that mess and that harassment is going to be gone. And that's what I'm getting excited about, and that's why I call it cleaning up the mess. And this is a, it's going to get, and I had a token of affirmation for what Cliff said. You talked about the candle, and it got a little messy while our light is burning, right? I said, thank you, Holy Spirit. I'm always looking for a token somewhere. Am I bringing the right message, right? And there it was. The Holy Spirit is in it today. Well, then I thought about um, this. Someone is collaborating with Mother's Day. What do mothers do most? Right, they get to clean up messes, don't they? <laughs> yeah. I know my mom got to, got to do her share. There was, uh, there was eight of us. Uh, well, the most at one time would have been seven. Uh, my younger sister passed away, and then I had another younger brother that came along. So, yeah, so she got to clean up after seven kiddos. And I'm, I'm sure I did my share of making messes. And so she cleaned me up really good. She uh, made sure I stayed clean from the day I was born. And so I really appreciate that. <laughs> yeah. Um, so when thinking about cleaning up the mess, I really thought about, uh, yeah, cleaning up after others, and that's what God does so much. When I think about mothers, it's just the attribute of God. Uh, when mothers do that, it's always, they always do that with the intent of refreshing and restoring, and that's something, that's the heart of motherhood, and, and we see a lot of that happening. I'm really grateful for that. You know, mothers, they have this ability to create a magic drawer. I don't know how mom did it, but that drawer always stayed full of clean socks. I'm like, wow, how did she do it? But yeah, so I just decided that's the magic drawer that I grew up with. They stayed full and clean all the time. I never saw it happen, so it must have been magical. I don't know how to do all that. I just want to say blessed uh, Mother's Day and, and just thank you for all the work that mothers do. All mothers here. It's, the work is really important that you all are doing. Word of Life is really really benefiting, benefiting from all that mothers do in this church. You know, when I, when I came home from Tuesday night from Rise, I really saw the importance of motherhood. Wow. That's one thing that was missing among those kids was motherhood. And, and they're, they're, they're missing a lot. And it just really made me thankful for motherhood. So yeah, blessings to you moms as, as, uh, as you um, have family around you, and, and may God just touch you with the touch of grace as you continue your work. Jesus said that the kingdom of God belongs to children and mothers. If I could just say one thing, when you're working among your children, especially if we see a lot of young mothers here and mothers-to-be, that uh, when you are working with children and cleaning up after a message, you're actually building the kingdom. The kingdom belongs to the children. Jesus said that, and so I'm just glad that the work of motherhood is, is raising the kingdom, furthering the kingdom of God. Wow, so thankful. I'm getting to where I should have just spoke on Mother's Day today. <laughs> yeah, it's hard to stop, but there's so much there. Yeah, keep it up. I would like to say one more thing, what motherhood belong, reminds me of is the work of God, especially the work of the Holy Spirit. It reminds me of motherhood. The way he gently comes along and helps us and reminds us. 
and the way the Holy Spirit gives us emotional stability in our Christian walk. That's what mothers do. Mothers, you are creating emotional stability in your home. That's what your calling is. That's what your gift is. So the, Holy, the work of the Holy Spirit is poured out through the mothers mostly in that way of the Holy Spirit in the home. I'm, I'm thankful for that. So here I thought that really I told my wife that I laughed and I said I had not thought about that. I messaged about cleaning up the mess and wait a minute, it's Mother's Day weekend. And I got, yeah, all of a sudden I was just like, it really, really goes hand in hand. It is for cleansing and restoring. And that's what the book of Re Revelation is all about. It's about bringing you in to the messy things. The mess started back in the Garden of Eden, and uh, it, it's finished up here in Revelation. And that's why I keep referring to Genesis as we're going along. It's, it's, um, it's all the stuff that broke then. We're living in a broken world. We're living in a messy world. And, and that's all going to get cleaned up one day. Uh, I would like to start with Psalm 110. Uh, Psalm 110 is, is beautiful about God's plan. And uh, when I think about Psalm 110, Jesus used the scripture and he uh, challenged the Pharisees with it. And he said, you say that the Messiah is the uh, son of David. And then he uh, quotes this, this scripture that we're to, to read. And he said, if this is so, if, he calls, if David called him Lord, how can he then be his son? And the Pharisees, they were like, nah, I never thought about that. So this is the scripture that Jesus would have talked about. So Psalm 110 uh, says, this beautiful seven verses here. It says, that the Lord saith to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord sends from Zion your mighty scepter, rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people will offer themselves freely on the day of your power in holy garments. From the womb of the morning, the dew of your mouth will be yours. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. The Lord is at your right hand. He will shatter kings on the day of his wrath. He will execute judgment among the nations, filling them with corpses. He will scatter uh, chiefs and over the white earth. He will drink from the brook by the way. Therefore, he will lift up his head. Beautiful prophecy that David saw that God, uh, the Messiah, would come, and then he would ascend back to power and send at the right hand of power until when? Until I make your enemies your footstool. That's what's going to happen in Revelations. I'm going to make your enemies your footstool. I'm going to clean up the mess, everything the enemy has always done. I'm going to do away with that. And I just love, but then, what is the church going to do then? Verse 3, your people will offer themselves freely on the day of your power. This is beautiful. I just have to say that I, it says you're willing. Your people offer themselves freely. Uh, other script, uh, translations talk about willing. You know, I'm not always fully willing of following Jesus every day. I have a problem with that. But the day of his power, when he comes, we're all going to offer ourselves willingly and freely. We're all going to say, here I am, God. I'm glad the day has come. It's going to be a great day. And the last verse is he's describing how he's, how he's going to not only uh, clean up the mess, but the mess makers, those are enemies that are constantly creating messes in our lives. And so what a day that will be. So I thought I would start off with the, um, Psalm 110. Let's go to Matthew chapter 13. And Jesus himself constantly talked about this day. I, I was marveled that Jesus talked more about the last days uh, the, the day of the Lord, then all the prophets and all the apostles combined. And so that's how much Jesus spoke about this. And so uh, it was constant in his parables. Uh, as all the chambers would say, all the teachings of Jesus have an element of judgment in them. We have to say amen. And so he is a rightful judge. And so he came to pay our price so that we would not fall under that judgment. We come under the judgment of the cross and we are redeemed. So here in Matthew uh, 13, let us read 24 and through 30. <clears throat> he put another parable before them, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in the field. But while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. So when the Plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared also. And the servants of the master of the house came and said to him, Master, did you not grow good seeds in your field? How then does it have weeds? 
He said to them, An enemy has done this. So the servant said to him, Then do you want us to go and gather them? But he said, No, lest in gathering the weeds, the wheat you root up, the wheat will come along with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And at the harvest time, I will tell the reapers, gather the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. So interesting, again, all of the teachings of Jesus, again and again, he brought out how things are going to end, how things will be finalized in the end. And so we find here that he said, no, let them grow together. If you, if you clean up the mess now, it's, it's going to be so detrimental. It's going, to, it's going to put an end to the good seed. And we can see that um, um, I, I farmed all my life, and I know how this works. I to the work in a farm is weed prevention. And if I didn't, I had some fields where I wasn't on time with prevention, and I had to, I had to deal with the cost later on, and it was, it was bad. Most of my chickens would go to the few fields that I hadn't paid attention to earlier. And I'm like, why did I do that? So I really understand this setting here. I talked to a seed farmer in Canada one time. He, uh, I think he did work in a fowl farm. Um, uh, there was another one. Think, um, black seed, I think it was. And so he... Um, I asked him, so what, what, what's the, the hardest thing about you uh, farming seed? He said, you know what, I'm on the weed, the tares are the worst. I said, oh, what does a tear look like? He said, that's the problem, it's just like weed. He said, you cannot tell the difference from a tear and a weed until actually the, the seed comes out. He said, by that time it's too late. We can't hardly, we can't hardly separate it. And so the, the translation here talks about weeds, but most of the time it talks about the weed and the tares. And he said that was the hardest part about seed farming in the wheat fields was exactly that. The look-alike that grows with it. And you can't tell one from another until the seed comes. And so, you know, we, we look at chapter 12 in Revelations, how it talks about, I mean 13, where the Antichrist comes and he, uh, the, he, he uses the, 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 his most powerful method, and that's deception. We have to remember that when the religion and the mark and all that comes, it's all going to look like Christianity. It's actually going to be, it's going to be called that. How will people know the difference? So, if, uh, so the most, and Jesus warned again and again uh, about deception. And so deception is part of the mess that's going to be cleaned up and the deceptor. So I'm just looking so forward to that. Uh, I would like to... Um, Read over uh, Second Thessalonians two, um, yeah, Second Thessalonians chapter two, and uh, one through twelve. And then we'll go into Revelations and continue. And these, uh, this is an interesting part of the message that has that has surprised me often. Let's see if I have my right Thessalonians here. Yes, it is Second Thessalonians, uh, one through twelve, and we're, here's a here's now we get a, a piece of how Paul would preach. Now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered together with Him, we ask you, brothers, not to be quickly shaken and in mind or alarm, either by a spirit or spoken word or letter, seemingly to be from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Let no one deceive you in any way, for that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first. And the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes a seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. Do you not remember when I was with you? Do you, do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? I want to stop here a little bit. Notice how he's reminding them. He said, look, guys, I told you this before. How is it that you, that you were so soon shaken again? Some have told him that Jesus had come already. Let's continue in verse 6. And you know that what is restraining him now, that he may be revealed in time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains it will do, will do so until he is taken out of the way. And when the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will kill with the breath of his mouth and bring to nothing by the appearance of his coming, the coming of the lawless one is by the activity of Satan with all power, false signs, and wonders. And with all wicked deception for those who are perishing, because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. Therefore, God sends them a strong delusion, so that they may believe what is false, 
in order that it may all be condemned, in order that it may all be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. These are some sobering words here. I mean, the whole Bible is a sobering word. But especially when we look about how, how Paul, so in his message we find that Paul would have preached often talking about the, the great day of the Lord. He says, don't you remember when I told you these things? So we get a little glimpse here of how he would have preached. If we would have sat in his church, that's what we would have heard. He spoke the truth. He spoke the Old Testament and the new revelation he had received. And that's the one thing I really want to bring out about um, uh, the last in verse 12. In order that all may be condemned who did not believe the truth, but have pleasure in unrighteousness. And in verse 11 tells us that God will send them strong delusion. So we're seeing a Romans chapter 1 analysis here over, over, the, global, over the, uh, the global covering that God will send them strong delusion. That's, that's another thing. I like the way an Indian preacher said this one time. He said, it's one thing to have Satan against me, but to have God against me. That's what, that's what we find here. He's going to send them strong delusion. God is saying, you chose this, you hated my truth, you hated my son, you hated my church. Time is up. Today is, this is the day of the Lord. Everything is cleaned up. So the thing of grace is that it's not eternal outside of eternity. It has its limits. It has its, each one of our lives, grace has a clock on it. I believe that it does. Those who waste it, those who, and Paul, he talks often about not, not ignoring the grace of God. So, I would like to now, uh, let's head to Revelation uh, chapter 14. And the book of the Bible, uh, we, we read through it as comparison. It, it always shows both sides. We just read Psalm 110. It talked about uh, the people of the Lord. They will be willing. They will be ready to serve Jesus. They're going to flock to him. They're going to run to him when he comes. They're going to be excited about seeing him. But then a few verses later, it talks about those who, you know, they're not going to fare so well. Proverbs does that, always in comparison, one against the other. And so does Revelation. But I want to separate. So today we're going to, um, we're going to get rid of the tares and those who sowed the tares. But the seed, he said, I gathered the seed in my barn. That I went to in the next message as we start finishing. We're going, to, we're going to concentrate on God's people, and that's how I want to end Revelations, how God's people are going to end up, where they're going to end up. And I'm really looking forward to that. These messages here, they need to be brought. They're not my favorite. Kind of like chapter 13 of Revelation. I'll, I'll wish to skip over all this. And I'll, I think everybody feels that way. That's why these teachings don't get done much in churches anymore today. I've, I've talked to people, and they said, wow, I haven't heard a message on destruction or anything like that. Been in church for 30 years, one man said. Never heard one. And so, and, 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 and I get those preachers. It's not, it ain't no fun. But it's one of those, uh, like eating vegetables, right? When I was... Children, who want, which children like to eat vegetables, right? But it needs to be done. <laughs> Part of the diet. And Jesus himself talked about it mostly, more than others. So when we look at Revelation 14, I'm going to kind of uh, look at some verses here to separate and toward, uh, toward the back and forth truth and comparison. So we'll look at uh, now The earlier part of 14 will belong to my next message. That, that uh, covers the children of God. But we're going to look, we'll look, look at the tares. We're going to be cleaning up messes today. So I'm going to be looking at those verses. Uh, Revelations 14 and uh, 14 and 16 and 17. This is what I call the harvest. Remember Jesus talked about the harvest? So here we are in Revelation chapter 14, verse 14. Then I looked, and behold, a white cloud, seated on the cloud, one like a son of man, with a golden crown on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. Here it is. The, the harvest is at hand. So he sees, uh, he sees a harvest is beginning to happen. But uh, that's, that's, that, we're going to talk about that harvest in, in my next message. That's the seed. That's the harvest of the good seed, right? But we want you to look at uh, verse uh, 16. It says, so he who sat on the cloud swung a sickle across the earth, and the earth was reaped. And so it talks about the, the, the final harvest of, of the good seed. But uh, then we look at 17. Then another angel came out of temple in heaven, and he too had a sharp sickle. 
Remember what Jesus said in his parable. He said the servants will come and they will, they will cut the tares down and bundle them up and, and burn them. They're going to separate them, right? Here's the great separation happening. The harvest is here. Um, I ran um, harvest machinery for years. Um, I would have ran grain combine first to, from 14 to um, about 16. And then I went, to, I went and worked on a peanut farm. Then I ran peanut combines for another three years. Peanut combines, totally different. So uh, one thing was very important was that the separator had enough air going to it to separate the two different harvests. And I, I was so excited. My dad bought a new combine, and finally we could adjust the air and everything from, from inside my cab. It used to have to get out and change pulleys on the fan and speed it up. And, and, the, and the peanut combines were still very primitive. They were still that way. So when we talk about the winds of persecution, creates a separation. So God is going to set this, the harvesters, they're going to have this wind going. The winds of persecution are going to separate God's people from the shaft. And, and the word tribulation is the same word used for harvest in the Old Testament, right? Where they would sickle the crop and then they would um, uh, uh, bring it home and then they would wait for, for high winds to come to throw it up and separate the, you know, the shaft from the sea. And so that was the three, the tri, tri the three, it's a, a three step, uh, and then the combine works the same way. The combine has a three step situation. So I remember uh, by the time I was 17, they made me manager of the harvest crew. We ran nine peanut combines. And that was, that was, uh, peanut combines a lot harder to set. So it all had to do with community coming and going, but, the, but separating, having that clean peanut in the basket was, was the idea. And so, uh, my boss would drive around, and, and uh, he would look at all the baskets. They were, had screens on the back and the front, and then he knew if I was doing my job or not, how clean the, the product was. So, yeah, cleaning up the mess. And so, so here we're, we're looking at, um, there, we got two harvests here. Let's go to, uh, yeah, so we saw how the reapers uh, are going to take care of that, and we see how, uh, how dramatic the harvest of this angel is going to be. And it's going to be, um, let's look at 20. And the wine press was trodden outside the city, and blood flowed from the wine press as high as a horse's bride from the 1600 stadia. So it's going to be a massive harvest. It's going to be massive. But, but these, are, these are the mess that's getting cleaned up. Um, let us now look at the reapers. Uh, we get to uh, chapter 15, and we're looking at, um, so who are the reapers? The reapers are the, the last seven angels who bring out the last seven plagues. They are the reapers. And they're going to finish this harvest. They're going to clean up the mess finally. They're the ones, they're, they're the follow-up crew. Remember, we've got three crews here, right? We had the seven seals, seven trumpets. And the seven trumpet is going to release these seven reapers. And so, uh, in the seventh uh, trumpet, uh, it all happens. And so, as we bring our message next time, we look at the seed, I will, I'll bear more on that. So uh, as we look over here, and um, it says here, uh, let's look at the first verses on 15. Then I saw another sign in heaven, great and amazing, seven angels with seven plagues, which are the last, for which them the wrath of God is finished. So they, they, they come and finish what, what uh, tribulation started. Five to eight. After this, I looked, and the sanctuary of the tent of witness in heaven was opened, and out of the sanctuary out came the seven angels with the seven plagues, clothed in purple, bright linen with golden sashes around their chest. Wow, these reapers, they're, they're talking about royalty here. Heavenly. Verse 7, And one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls full of the wrath of God, who lives forever and ever. And the sanctuary was filled with smoke from the glory of God, from his power, and no one could enter the sanctuary until the seven plagues and the seven angels were finished. That's interesting. We saw the temple open when we talked about worship last time. And he saw the ark there. Another reason the temple, this door gets open, to release the seven reapers. This temple has not been prepared to do this before. You know how Jesus, when he took the scrolls, he took the power to begin to reign. The seventh trumpet was power was handed over to Jesus, and Jesus opens the door of the temple, and the, the seven reapers are being prepared. He sees the ark. This is the same temple that says they, that's where they came out of. They are commissioned. These seven special angels are commissioned, and they're beautiful. Just look at them. Uh, they're 
uh, wow, just and, and here in verse 6, and out of the sanctuary came seven angels, the seven plagues, clothed in, in, in pure, bright linen, with golden sashes around their chest. And the golden sashes around the chest is just a, a symbol of servanthood. And just, this is beautiful. The, the temple's being opened. Earlier he saw the ark. Now he sees his reapers coming out. And each one gets, gets a bowl handed to them. Uh, chapter 16, uh, 5 through 7. And I heard the angel in charge of the water say, Just are you, O holy one, who is and who was, for you brought these judgments. For they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and you have given them blood to drink. It is what they deserve. And I heard the altar saying, Yes, Lord God, the Almighty, true and just are your judgments. Beautiful, clean angels, and they're, they're, going, to, they're going to do a, a finished work of, of the of reaping of the harvest. Some of the things, we're not going to look at all of them, but I'm going to give an example here, A through 9. The fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and it allowed to scorch people with fire. They were scorched by the fierce heat, and they cursed the name of God, who had power over the plagues. They did not repent and give him glory. Verse 21. And great hailstones, about 100 pounds each, fell from heaven on people, and they cursed God for the plague of the hail because the plagues were so severe. There, this, this is a work of finality. Um, I know, I know my harvest, once they went through my grain combine, once they went through my peanut combines, it was done. Uh, it, 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 was, it was done. The seed was separated and the seed would never be mingled again with the other. It was a final separation. That's the beauty of this. Now then, about the sun, uh, I have been asked by people over time, do you believe in climate change? And I tell them I surely do. I told them it's in Revelation, chapter 16. I tell them you ought to check it out. Climate change is coming. It's here. Do I believe in climate change? Yes, I do. And so here we see that the sun, we, um, I don't know if it's going to happen this way. The sun has its own power. We have a shield around the earth, right, the, the atmosphere. And to me, it looks like the atmosphere is going to be pulled back like a curtain, and the earth is going to get direct sunlight, no protection. So our atmosphere protects us from the harsh rays coming, right? So that's... Uh, that's what I think is going to happen, but we can all estimate on that. So, yeah, uh, climate change is on the way, and it's not going to be in the best of interest of, of, of people. It's, it's going to be towards those, towards those who, who have made a decision, as Paul said. They, they hated the truth. They hated God, and, and they kept that position. But let us be remember, what I'm reading here, the separation has already happened. I'm going to bring out more of that beauty in the next message. We're going to look at the sea. So this is the beauty of it. So... The, the, the separation will already have happened here when the reapers, when the second angel comes with his reaper, the other, just remember, the other harvest is done already by a different person. So th this is great. I'm, I'm getting really excited. And that's why I keep reading Revelations over and over. As I get to the end, wow, my spirits is raising. I'm praising. I'm, um, I'm yeah, we are heading to a good place. So um, as I look at another picture, some, the scene changes again. And uh, chapter 17 is a very interesting chapter. I always call it uh, the other woman chapter. Uh, Proverbs calls her the strange woman. Proverbs, Solomon said, my son, keep your steps away from this strange woman. He said, I looked out of my window and I saw an unsuspecting young man. And she approaches the young man and she says to him, come, live with me. Let us drink stolen waters together. And, and Solomon says, and unknowingly he follows her path. And then Solomon says in Proverbs, not knowing that her steps lead to Sheol, Hades. And then Solomon says, all who follow her, none of them return. That's the woman of, of chapter 17 of Revelation. And so, um, Let's read the first couple of verses. 
Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came out and said to me, Come, I will show you the judgments of the great prostitute who is seated on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed sexual immorality, and with the wine of the, whose sexual immorality the dwellers on earth have become drunk. And he carried me away in the spirit into a wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on the scarlet beast that was full of blasphemous names and had seven heads and ten horns. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and jewels and pearls and holding in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the impurities of her sexual morality. And on the forehead was written the name of a mystery, Bible on the grave, mother of prostitutes and of earth's abominations. And I saw, and I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints, the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. This woman has been around a long time. She doesn't just appear here. She's identified again who she is. Her name is Lady Religion. Her name is Deception. You notice uh, the, uh, the horns and the, uh, uh, it described her as at the end of verse 3. And it had seven heads and ten horns, the beast, right? This was the beast of chapter 13. The, uh, the religious prophet, this is her. She's the deceptor. And, she, and she's riding a beast. Now, have you noticed that in history, the kings have always had a, a, a sidekick of a religionist to, to deceive the people? The countries all have that. There is no a, a political realm out there that doesn't have a religion on the side as well. If you'll notice the war going on in Ukraine right now, the leader of the other side said, uh, we're talking spiritual space here. He used the word spiritual. And when you look behind the scenes, you look what he's part of. He says, oh, this war's starting to make sense. Lady Mystery's there with him. And so she pops up in and out of history. Um, this cup, this cup, you know our Anabaptist forefathers who lost their lives? They're in this cup. All the martyrs of Jesus are in that cup. Lady religion is threatened by God's people. Lady religion hates godly people. Her name changes throughout history. During Samson's time, her name was Delilah. During Elijah's time, her name was Jezebel. During Jer uh, Jeremiah's time, her name was the Queen of Heaven. Amazing. Each of the prophecies, you find her. John the Baptist, her name was Herod's wife. Notice how she's been around all the time who hates godly men. And Joseph, Potiphar's wife. Do we see the trend here? She's been around the whole time. But over here, she's one of the mess makers. She's going to be dealt with. Uh, we're looking at, um, I'd like to read to the end of the chapter, uh, 15 through 18. And the angel said to me, the waters that you saw where the prostitute is seated, her peoples where the prostitute are peoples and multitudes and nations and languages. And the ten horns that you saw, they are the beasts that will hate the prostitute. They will make her desolate and naked and devour her flesh and burn her up with fire. For, for God has put it in their hearts to carry out his purposes by being one of mine and handing over royal power to the beast until the words of God are fulfilled. And the woman that you saw is a great city that has dominion over all the kings of the earth. Now she turns into a city. This will be the capital of the global enterprise of the Antichrist when he comes down on the earth. This city would be called the great city. The world will never before have seen a city as this. You notice how rich she was? How dirty she was, how messy she was, all that's going to get cleaned up. This religious thing, this deception that had deceived so many people over history will be done away with.
Did you notice that God uh, cleans her up and he does it through the ten kings and God puts it in their heart? Do we see God's sovereignty in all this? These ten kings are not necessarily doing what they want. It says God put it in their heart to get rid of her. So who's in control? God is. Throughout all of tribulation, God is in control. From the first till the last, until it finishes up. I would like to just pick up a little bit about the mark of the beast. It appears, I'm just going to say it appears this way. You notice there's three digits. The first one is going to be the mark of the dragon, the second the mark of the beast, and the third is going to be her mark. It appears that the mark is going to look like a tattoo, whatever it's going to be, ingrained. Some think it's the vaccine, some think it's a chip. But I really think it's going to be a visual acceptance of worship that's going to look, it's going to have symbolic of, of, of the dragon. And the satanic temples always use a star. Well, another copycat, you know, the Star of David. It just looks like another copycat thing. And uh, that star has an interesting look to it. And, and the second one most likely would be the symbol of the government. That's a symbol of the America, right? We'd say the flag or, or, their, or their other symbols. And, but this third one, I think it's going to be the, the mark of the religion of the day, the global religion that this capital city will be uh, ruling I think that, that's going to be the third mark. So I, I really believe that that's why we have three digits here. Now, where is this capital city going to be? That's a good question. Some think it's going to be in Dubai. Some think it's going to be New York. Some think it's going to be Los Angeles, right, because they're rich and powerful. But let us remember, when, the, when this beast comes to rule, he's going to do away with all that. He's setting up something new. So that remains to be seen. But by this time, we don't need to worry about it. The separation will have happened already. So I'm going to talk more about the rapture and all that next time. So like I said, now we're talking about cleaning up the mess, right? And uh, eighteen one through 3, I'll read that. And after this, I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was made bright with his glory. And he called out with a mighty voice, Fallen, 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 the great. She has become a dwelling place for demons, a haunt for every unclean spirit, a haunt for every unclean bird, a haunt for every unclean and detestable beast. For all the nations have drunk the wine of the passions of her sexual morality, and the kingdom and the kings of the earth have committed immorality with her. And the merchants of the earth have grown rich from the power of luxurious living. So yeah, it's, it's, it's going to be uh, absolutely disgusting. It's going to be very rich, and that's going to be the idea is that people are going to want that, that riches. Uh, sexual morality is always on the top of the list. And I want to uh, read a verse here. I'm going to skip over for some time. Looks like the time is up here. Um, uh, let's go from verse 11 through 13 in chapter 18. And the merchants of the earth weep and mourn for her, since no one buys her cargo anymore. Cargo of gold, silver, jewels, pearls, fine linen, purple cloth, silk, scarlet cloth, and all kinds of uh, scented, scented, scented wood. All kinds of articles of ivory, all kinds of articles of costly wood, bronze, iron, and marble, cinnamon, spice, incense, mirth, frankincense, wine, oil, fine flour, wheat, cattle with sheep, horses, and chariots, and slaves. And that is human souls. The other one all sounds very normal, the stuff they're trading. But this last sentence bothers me. This last sentence would suggest human trafficking, slavery. There is a phenomenon taking place as we speak of human trafficking worldwide. And it, it talks about slaves and that of human souls. And so this city and the whole globe will be run through human trafficking. I read not long ago that in Germany today, there are 40,000 brothels in that country. It takes 800,000 people to run those, those brothels. And they said almost all of them are immigrants. They, they're all immigrants to their system. And what happens is, in the refugee camps, you have these people that go around, 
and they say that we'll buy our way to Germany, to France, and then you pay us back when you get there. And you know where they end up. The world is broken. It angers me when I read this. It saddens me when I read this. These are children involved. It said the average ages. It's horrible. Absolutely horrible. And so this, and that, that's growing right now. And countries, it's like, they're, they're okay with it. They have, yeah, some of the laws are, they've got some seeing operations going, but nothing compared to what should be, what should be happening. So when I come to that part, that is something where we're just seeing a, an increase of. It says it happens in one hour. Um, instead of reading, I'm just going to say what happens here. You know, they, are, they are crying, they are mourning. Uh, chapter 18, I call that the, uh, the boo-hoo of the wicked. And uh, that's what's happening. They're, they're constantly saying that. Um, they Look at verse 19. And they threw dust on their heads as they wept and mourned, crying out, alas, alas, for the great city where all the ships at sea grew rich by her well. For one single hour she has been laid waste. The reaping won't take long in one hour. It's going to be fast. When the time is up, it's going to take one hour for the reaping. And also, cleaning up the mess and the mess makers. Chapter 20, I'd like to end with that because we need to clean up the mess all the way today. So we'll take a little extra time here. Uh, chapter 20, 1 through 3. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hand a key to the bottomless pit and a great chain. And he sees the dragon, that ancient serpent, who was the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years, and threw him into the pit and shut it and sealed it over him, so that he might not deceive the nations any longer till the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be released for a little while. 7 through 15. And when the thousand years are ended, Satan will be released from his prison, and he will come out and deceive the nations that are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle. The numbers like the sand of the sea, and they march up over the broad plain of the earth, and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. But the fire came down from heaven and consumed them. And the devil had deceived them, was thrown in the lake of fire and sulfur, where the beasts and the false prophet were. They will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Let's go back to um, uh, 19 and read the end of it from 17 to the end. Then I saw another angel standing in the sun with a loud voice. He called to the birds that flew directly overhead, Come gather for the great supper of God, to eat the flesh of the kings, the flesh of cats, the flesh of mighty man, the flesh of horses, their riders, and the flesh of all man, both free and slave, the small and great. And I saw the beasts and the kings of the earth with their armies gathered to make war against them who was sitting on the horse against his army. And the beast was captured with the false prophet who in the presence had come, has done the signs which to deceive those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped its image. These two were thrown alive into a lake of fire that burns with sulfur. And the rest were slain by the sword and came and came from the, from the mouth of him who was sitting on the horse and all the birds were gorged with the flesh. And so we're, we're seeing that um, the, the end has now come. The, the beast and the false prophet are the first ones to be thrown into the lake of fire. Another thing, the birds are called and they're offered a supper. So there's two suppers in Revelations. We're going to talk about the other supper next time. That's where we're going to eat supper. Over here, the people are the supper. You see the difference? Yeah, there, there's two suppers in Revelation. Uh, one where people get to eat. And the other one is where the people are the supper. So the relation has a lot of two and two and two coming along with that. So hopefully I can uh, cover some more of that uh, later. Whew. Wow. <laughs> Cleaning up messes is hard work, right? 
Which one of us likes to do that? I don't. You don't. But it has to be done, and God's going to do it. And it's going to, the great day of the Lord, it's going to happen. It's going to have a finality. It's going to be done. The great separation will happen. And from that time on, all the things that have bothered us, all the things that have hindered us will be eliminated. Will be eliminated. It's going to be like, you know, before we enter heaven, it's going to be like taking this clean shower, right? All are going to be washed away. All are going to be washed away. And so that we'll be looking at more next time. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Father God, we thank you for your word. We thank you how the Bible ends. We thank you how it begins. And you say that you know the end from the beginning. Jesus, you said, I am the beginning and the end. I'm the Alpha and the Omega. And we thank you we can come into your word and we can uh, look at these things and just be assured that as you told these, these wicked ten kings, you controlled them and told them what they had to do. And they did it. And we see your sovereignty in all of this. But the harvest is coming, and God, I'm so thankful that there's a picture of seed in this, in this harvest. And I'm so forward to sharing that next time. Thank you, God, for all you've given us. Thank you, for uh, again, for motherhood. That, uh, yeah, clean up messes, restore things, refresh things. We thank you for the Holy Spirit that does it with us individually. And we thank you that that will happen in the whole world one day. We're looking so forward to that. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah. Good morning again. Um, I join the others in welcoming you. Uh, Clifford, we're glad you're back. And to the visitors, welcome. And to all of you, we're glad you're here. So this is your time. The ushers are bringing mics. If you've got a response to the uh, sermon, that would be great. Or if you've other things on your on your heart to share, that would that's fine too.